just a moment. Um, you adults, at this time, I'm asking that you uh, open up your copy of God's Word to Psalm 51. Adults and any children that are still here, uh, Psalm 51. This summer, we've been taking a journey through the Psalms. Summer in the Psalms, we do that every year, and uh, we're trying to get all 150, uh, which we're, we're making a pretty good, pretty good push at it. Um, this morning we're going to be in Psalm 51. It's a psalm that you probably have heard. Um, there are a few verses within Psalm 51 that are from, more familiar than others. Um, a lot of songs have come out of this, uh, this passage. Uh, psalm 51 is one of the penitential psalms. There's six different psalms that um, are part of what they, they, they call the penitential psalms. Uh, psalm 6, 38... 51, 102, 130, and 143. They're often used as corporate confessions. Um, times like the week, the Holy Week, um, the week of Easter, Resurrection Sunday, and, and approaching that, a lot of times um, churches and, and different people will go through the penitential psalms um, through Lent. Uh, sometimes it's even used, this passage and the other ones of the penitential psalms are sometimes used as um, like a sinner's guide, like dealing with sin, confessional time. Uh, today, I want us to look at this psalm, and, and it's really an ideal way of handling our sin. Uh, sin is a serious issue. Um, our society does not take sin seriously. Um, this is what I mean by that. If you watch any show on TV, any movie, any, anything that you're watching, social media, we laugh at sin. We laugh at it. Uh, you know, in the TV or, or, or movies in particular, uh, when there's somebody that's doing something sinful, they try to make us laugh at it. We, we, try, to, we try to laugh at it. We, we let our guard down. It doesn't seem so uh, opposed to holy God if we laugh at it and kind of joke with it and, and kind of mix a little good in with a little of the bad. And sin's a serious issue. And Paul um, talks about it. We're going to talk a little bit in a, a few verses from Paul, but David in his confession before the Lord is going to deal with it head on. Uh, we, we tend to laugh at sin. We celebrate sin oftentimes, and we simply just don't take it serious. We love to point out other people's sins, especially ones that we don't struggle with. Like, I, I, there's certain sins I don't struggle with, and it never even crosses my mind. And, but if someone else does it, I just look down my nose and think, how in the world could you make such a terrible decision? And we do that. Even within the church, we, we, uh, we hide more sins than others. We might sin in front of somebody, and we don't think much about it. You know, maybe, maybe one of those little, maybe those one little words, not that bad, but, you know, not that good. You know, one that I got in trouble for, my mama, but she's not here anymore, so I don't get in trouble with them. You know, I might say that word, but I would never, ever think about, you know, like killing somebody, right? Like, that's, that's off the table. But sin is sin. And God's a holy God. And when we defy him and we go against what he says and what he wants us to do, we need to handle it seriously. I'm as guilty as anybody, and I've been studying on this for the last couple of weeks. I've been getting my, my feet stepped on, and uh, so now it's your turn, right? Uh, we're going to look in Psalm 51 that David dealt head on, and he got to the heart of the matter when he was confronted with his own sinfulness. Uh, we're not going to go there today uh, for the sake of time. I've already been told by a few how long I have to preach. And so I'm not going to go back to 2 Samuel chapter 12. But if you go back to the end of chapter 11 and the beginning of chapter 12, we're going to see that, uh, and you know, probably know the story of David. David, who was the king, who was number one in control. And most kings would have been away at battle. And instead, he was at home, and he starts letting his eyes wander, and he sees a lady um, that's, that's bathing, on sunbathing, or she's on the roof or whatever, and he's like, hey, I want to tell me about this lady. And he calls for her, and he can do that. He's in charge. And he does and realizes, well, well he, he realized really quick that that probably was not a wise decision. He met Bathsheba. Bathsheba and, um, and, and David laid together. Um, she became pregnant, and he now has to cover up this sin. And so David calls for Uriah the Hittite, who happens to be Bathsheba's husband, to come back from battle, come back from what he's supposed to be doing, where, he, where David is supposed to be. And, uh, and he thought, well, I'll just have them lay together. They'll, they'll do that tonight or you know, before he goes back, and you know, I'll cover up my sin. Well, um, Uriah was such a loyal man that was supposed to be at battle, he chose not to do that. He slept outside. 
and uh, he didn't do that. So then they were like, well, we'll just get him drunk and make it to where, you know, he, he won't have any control over his own self, and so we can cover up my sin that way. And it still didn't work. And so Uriah went back into battle. They, 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 they went to one of the, the, the most violent of areas, and they literally called back people to, to pull back so Uriah the Hittite could be uh, in a situation that he would no longer be an issue. So Uriah the Hittite was murdered at the command of David. So there's no problem now. No one's going to know about this, right? But the Lord allows sometimes things that are hidden and in secret to become public. And uh, David was met with the prophet Nathan. Nathan tells a story. And I'm not going to go through the whole, it's, it's, it's a great passage. Um, but, but Nathan goes to David and tells him a story about this, this man who had um, everything and had all these, uh, all these animals. And then he talks about this one who didn't have but one animal. And, and the one who had so much took away from the one that he shouldn't have taken. And, and basically enraged, uh, David was asked by Nathan, what would you do about this? Like what a, what a messed up situation where this guy who had everything takes from the one who had nothing else takes and what would you do and he was just so enraged and he's like you have to deal with that we got to we're going to this guy's got to be dealt with and Nathan said something that every man loves to hear but not for this reason Nathan looked at David and says you're the man but it wasn't a good you're the man it was this is you and I speak on behalf of the Lord and I'm going to tell you that you've been you're going to be dealt with and, and it says in Scripture that David immediately was remorseful, immediately confessed. Immediately, he didn't try to back out. He had been caught. And in Psalm 51, we have an opportunity to look inside at his confession and his time with the Lord. I, I wonder uh, if David, when he was writing this, if he thought, hey, in a couple thousand years, there's going to be people that are going to hear my prayer time with the Lord. Well, we're going to. So Psalm 51. Let's look at that now. I'm going to read all, all uh, 19 verses here. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin, for I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth and in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a, a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from blood guiltiness. O God, O God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. For you will not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O oh God, you will not despise. Do good to Zion in your good pleasure. Build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then will you delight in right sacrifices, in burnt offerings, and whole burnt offerings. Then bulls will be offered on your altar. Father, we just ask that in the next few moments that you would bring clarity to your word. And may it be applicable to every one of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Today, I want us to look at this fact. When we deal with our sin in the right way, when we deal with our sin in the right way, there is internal cleansing, spiritual transformation, and public profession that takes place. The first thing I want us to look at today, that, that first section is dealing with our sin. David realized that he had to have internal cleansing over external cleansing. He had to have internal cleansing over external cleansing. Let's just break this down. In verse 1, he starts, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy. Blot out my transgressions. Here's David's plea for mercy. 
and, his, and God's loving kindness. David acknowledges that it's his sin, was, it was willful disobedience. When we see that word transgression, which I think we see it three times in this passage, it, it means it was a willful defiance, a willful disobedience. He knew what he was doing was wrong. And he, he went against the divine law, against holy God, but he asked when he says, blot out my transgression, he literally is saying, will you obliterate the record? Will you erase completely my sin? David was a big sinner, and we know that. If, if you've heard the story like I already kind of recounted a moment ago, David's a big sinner. But that's not what he's known as. The Lord gave him the title of the man after God's own heart. We talk about Rahab. The prostitute, that, that's, that's what we know of her. David was the man after God's own heart. What's the difference there? Like, why do some people get known for their sin and some people get known for, like, something good? Like, I, I, don't, know, I don't know about you, but I've got, I've got some stories that are attached to my name. Some are great. Some are not so great. And, and David did some really dumb things. He was a big sinner. But we're going to see here in this passage, he was also a big repenter. And when we sin in such a way that defies holy God, we must come to him holy. We must come to him humbly. We must come to him low. And we must ask the Lord to do some internal cleansing inside of us. Leviticus, and he knew that it, like what he did was wrong. Leviticus 20.10 says that an adulterer would be put to death. Exodus 21.12 says that murderers were put to death. So David had a double he had a double portion of guilt here. He was a murderer, he was an adulterer, and he was to be put to death. And he knew that, that his sin defied what the Lord said. It was willful disobedience, that word transgression. And so he continues, he says, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. He's essentially asking the Lord to rid him of the entire mess that he's put himself in. And they were accustomed to ceremonial cleansing. David was accustomed to that. So ceremonial cleansing, being cleansed outwardly where everybody could see where he had messed up and it was a ritualistic thing. Like he was accustomed to that, but he knew this is not what he needed. He didn't need something on the outside. He didn't need the external cleansing that made it look like everything was fine. He needed internal cleansing. Some people don't like it when I say this, but anytime I'm baptizing, I always say, this is Sherman water. I don't even drink that stuff. But when we're baptized, it's not because it's externally cleansing us. It is not washing our sin away. It is a picture of what God has done internally inside of us. And David knew he wasn't going to be he wasn't going to get by with external cleansing here. He says in verse 3, "For I know my transgressions." Again, willful defiance. I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. He knew that even on his best day, he was sinful. Even on your best day, even though you hide it pretty well at church, you're sinful. On your best day, you need holy God to purify you and obliterate and erase your sin. He also knows that you have to deal seriously with that sin. God will deal with us according to our, um, our handling of our sin um, that's not to say that consequences go away, but I'm just going to tell you, when you come to holy God and let him know that we are repentant, we are, and he knows our heart, he does, it's not just lip service, he knows if we're sincere and, and we really are repentant, turning from our ways, the Lord deals gently with us. He, he, he deals with mercy, but it's not to say there's not consequences, and we, we actually see this right in David's life. As soon as, if you look at... I think it's like verse 10 of chapter 12, 2 Samuel 12, 10, something like that. Nathan addresses his sinfulness, and David immediately repents. David, he, he immediately confesses. He immediately de starts dealing with his sin. But if you read a couple verses later, it talks about one of the consequences of his sin. Within the next seven days, the son in which had been conceived with Bathsheba would have died. He died. But it talks about that leading up to that, that he was repentant and he was on his face before the Lord through the night. He, uh, his elders would try to talk to him and he was just pouring out confession and pouring out before the Lord. And the Lord allowed the son to not live. Immediate consequences. 
immediate consequences. Right after Nathan addresses this, he says in 2 Samuel 12, 10 and 11, Now therefore the sword shall never depart from your house. Now, now, mind you, this is after David confesses before Nathan. Now therefore the, the sword shall never depart from your house because you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, behold, I will raise up evil against you out of your own house. And I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor, and he shall lie with your, and he shall lie with your wives in the sight of the sun. Sin, when we deal with it, the Lord is merciful, but that doesn't mean there's not consequences. And as a kid, I remember, okay, I'm about to get in trouble. It was one of those, when your daddy gets home, moments. And I would, Lord, will you please forgive me? For all the sins I have. In fact, we, we pray that often. We do that at the dinner table. It, it's just part of what we pray oftentimes. Lord, will you forgive all of our sins? Well, I wish it was that easy. Like if we say that phrase, everything's obliterated and, and no consequences come. But that's not what happens. David was dealt with harshly. Was told he was going to be. And we know about some of the, the consequences. We don't know everything. In your life, you can't just push a button or hit the phrase or say the phrase, Lord, forgive me for all the wrong I've done. Like, you can mean that intentionally, and, 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 and you can sincerely mean that, but that doesn't mean there are not consequences. David realized that. He says this, against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. David realized that he had been in opposition to God. Usually we worry about the sin that affects us. And we worry about how sin affects others. Maybe not because we're so kind that we don't want sin to affect others. We just don't want other people to know about our sin. We don't want people to know our problems. We don't want people to know that we've been yelling and screaming at each other. And we pull into the church parking lot and then, hey, good to see you, brother in the Lord. I mean, y'all do the same thing I do. I just happen to be here before most of y'all walk in. So I have a, a little bit of time to, to, all right, all right. All right, I probably didn't handle that one real well this morning. Uh, there's a reason why my wife and I ride in separate cars on Sundays. <laughs> because she would be here on time or early, and I would always be late. And it causes a little strife. I'm not going to tell you whose fault it is. <laughs> but I'll keep moving. David realized that he had to deal head on, and he had sinned against the Lord. And no phrase or button or ceremonial cleansing was going to do the trick. Usually we worry about how we affect others, but David worried because he was sinning against the holy God. David went from covering up his sin to being literally broken over defying God. Verse 5, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and sin, and my mother conceived and did, sin did my mother conceive me. David knows that he's not only a sinner... As in verb, he sins, but he's also a sinner as in a noun. He, he is a sinner. That's, that's what he was born in. We were born into sinfulness. Verse 6, behold, your delight in truth and in the inward being, you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. We can do all the right things outwardly. We can convince people in our church. We can convince people in our life group. We can convince people in our family. We can convince our coworkers. We can convince other people how amazing, godly, Christian man or woman we are. But God knows our hearts. God knows the situation. And David knew the root of the problem was here. The Lord looks at the heart, he looks at the mind, he looks at the soul, and I shudder at the thought of what he thinks about me on my best day. And David was met with that reality that his sinfulness was something that he had to deal with at the heart of the matter. So not only is the internal cleansing over the external cleansing, because that's where the Lord deals with it, the second thing I want us to look at is that spiritual transformation over behavior modification. Spiritual transformation over behavior modification. Verse 7, purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. You've, you've heard back in Exodus when Moses um, asked the elders of Israel to kill a lamb and to um, the Passover lamb and take a bunch of hyssop. 
and dip it in the blood, the, the, the basin of blood. And the hyssop was a plant that's similar to a brush, and it would give off the fibers of a brush. And so they would take the hyssop, dill it, uh, dip it in the blood, and they would wipe it over the lintel and over the two doorposts of the blood. That was Passover. And so, so David says, purge me with hyssop. And I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. So essentially, David was asking God to purify him with hyssop. He is referring to the process of sacrifice and of the sprinkling of blood. Do you, do you hear that? David knew there was one who could wipe away his sins. What can wash away my sin? Wash me with hyssop. So that I can be whiter than snow. Isaiah 118, come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall become like wool. David was not asking for an external and he was cleansing, and he wasn't asking for behavior modification. He was saying, Lord, here I am. Search me, know me, see if there's any wicked way in me, deal with me completely, internally, and I'm asking you to do transformation in my life. Spiritual transformation is better than behavior modification. But let me tell you a little secret. I was a student pastor for 15 years. Let me tell you what student pastors, at least I did, and everybody I was uh, uh, colleagues with, we wanted behavior modification. We wanted a kid that would be in attendance in the student ministry. We wanted them to, to memorize whatever verses of scripture we asked them to memorize. We wanted them to be nice, say yes ma'am, no ma'am, yes sir, no sir. We wanted them to do all the things that we wanted them to do. And we didn't put a whole lot of stock, or at least not as much as we should have, in the spiritual transformation of their life. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to name names, but like when I've been on social media and I look back to kids that were always there, would never miss anything, go to every mission trip, go to every choir camp, every... Every lock-in, every Bible study on Wednesday night, Sunday school, they had their shirt tucked in, nice looking good on Sunday morning. They did all the right things, and now they're agnostic, atheist, would never touch a church, not going to bring their family up in the church, and they, but they were really, really, behavior, their behavior was really good when I was a student pastor. However, there's also people that I'm like, knuckleheads, like I, I think right now, like, oh my goodness, as a sixth grader, I wanted to just strangle that kid. That girl in the, as her sophomore year, oh my goodness, like, like a spawn of Satan. I, I really thought that. And these ladies and these young men are now like preachers and faithful fathers and faithful wives and love Jesus and are discipling their own children, discipling others. Because I focused on the behavior modification instead of being the disciple maker that I should have been because it was a lot easier when you had... A bunch of students that behaved. And the church has done the same thing. Like I, I, I gave the student ministry a bad rap, but the church has done the same thing. As long as we behave, we must be good Christian men and women, right? That's, the, that's this idea that we have. But David was not about the external. He knew he needed spiritual transformation, not behavior modification. Now, it comes... Behavior modification does come as a result of spiritual transformation. That's part of the repentance process. It does come. He continues, he says, uh, he says uh, let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Now, that's an interesting verse. Uh, I actually love that verse. As one who has a broken bone that does not work, uh, this pinky does not work. Y'all know that if you've been here the you know, last four years, I broke it because I was following my pastor's lead and I got hurt. <laughs> Two surgeries later, my pinky doesn't bend. Broken bones, they tend to heal and come back even stronger. Sometimes they don't work at all. But I love what he said here. He was dealing with, like, like sinfulness when it's being dealt with is, is not fun. There's agony when you're going through brokenness and pain. It hurts. But David was saying it's worth it. It is worth it. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Similar to verse 1, but he adds that word all. David doesn't just want a clean heart. He wants a clean slate. He wants a, a new start. 
He says in verse 10, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Or, or some, some uh, translations say renew a steadfast spirit within me. The work done in us, listen to that again, the work done in us is more important than the work done for us. Like, I'm thankful that the Lord forgives us. But when the Lord doesn't do spiritual transformation in our heart, we're going to go back to the same old pattern of defiance. The outward change comes as a result of the inward change. Transformation, spiritual transformation, there is a byproduct of behavior modification, but we can't get those switched. We can't, get those flip, we can't flip those around because then we start walking as though we are holy. We have this false humility and false holiness that comes, and that's not the right order. Spiritual transformation precedes behavior modification if it's going to honor the Lord. 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. When the Lord does a spiritual work in our life, he changes us from the inside out. Verse 11. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. David was concerned that he was going to have broken friendship, a broken relationship and broken fellowship with the Holy Spirit. He wanted to continue. Holy Spirit is the parakletos, the one who walks alongside of, and he brings conviction, and he brings counsel, and he brings assistance. And David was so worried that he might not have the Holy Spirit because of his sin, and he says, Lord... Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Now, I'm just going to tell you, sometimes the Holy Spirit convicts and it's not, it does not feel good. You know that feeling, you know the feeling when the Lord convicts you of something and you just wake up the next morning sick to your stomach. Not, not that anybody would ever know, but you're dealing harshly with yourself about a decision you made, a comment you made, the way that you made a comment, an, act, an action that you had. The Holy Spirit convicts, and David says, I don't, I don't want to lose the Holy Spirit. I don't want to lose that conviction. I don't want to lose the prodding of the Holy Spirit. Now, I'm just going to tell you, the Holy Spirit sometimes hurts when he convicts, but I'm going to tell you the pain receptors in my hand when I touch something hot that says, get your hands off of that, while it does hurt, what is it really doing? It's protecting me from something a whole lot worse than just a little, ow, that hurts. The Holy Spirit brings conviction because he's trying to say, Warning, step back, stop. You don't need that. I promise you, it's only going to get worse. You need to, you need, and and David didn't want to lose that. Verse 12, restore, restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. The joy of our salvation can only come from the Lord. Now, oftentimes we read that passage, restore to me the joy of my salvation. That's, That's how we would say it. But it's not my salvation. If you're dependent on me saving you, we're in trouble. And David knew that it wasn't the joy of his own salvation. There was one that he could receive joy from. That deep abiding confidence in Christ Jesus. So when he says, restore to me the joy of your salvation, uphold me with a willing spirit. He's saying, Lord, it's only your salvation that can give us, uh, give us joy. And I'm asking you to do that. And David realized that the concealment of his sin worked for just a little bit. There was a few people that knew what was going on, but the concealment of sin was disastrous, and he needed to bring, he wanted joy of of the Lord's salvation, so he he confessed. He brought confession into the mix. The the third aspect of today I want us to look at is is public profession over private confession. Now, before I get here, I want you to know that this is going to sound, at least at first, uh, completely opposed to the first, first point of internal cleansing versus external. But David, he valued and chose public profession over private confession. I think you'll understand where I'm going in just a moment. Verse 13. Then I will teach transgressors. There's that word again. People that willfully defy the Lord. Then I will teach transgressors in your ways and sinners will return to you. When we have been transformed, it's not just for our benefit. It benefits others too. Just like our sinfulness doesn't just affect us, it affects others in a negative sense. Verse 14, deliver me from blood guiltiness. Guiltiness. O God, O God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. He may have deserved death. That's what Leviticus says. He deserved death as an adulterer. He also deserved death as a murderer. He deserved death, but he says, deliver me. And my tongue will sing of your, 
uh, sing aloud of your righteousness. He says, I may have deserved death, but I'm going to be overflowing with praise if you were to forgive me. We all deserve death. We, we may not be an adulterer or a murderer in this room, although there might be some of each because the Lord says if you hate a brother, you killed him. Like the same thing as murder. If, if you look on with your eyes to someone else that's not yours, that's adultery. Maybe, maybe it wouldn't classify it in the case of, of law here in, in, in the state of Texas, but I'm going to tell you that the Lord says that's how we need to deal with our sin. It's, it's, a, it's an offense to a holy God. And he says... We all deserve death, but, but I think of like um, uh, Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. I don't know how many of you watched the Hall of Fame speeches for NFL last night. Anybody, anybody happen to watch it? You're like, NFL, what, what's that? I get it. <clears throat> I get it. But I watched uh, late last night. I started just flipping through some of this. I love hearing some of the speeches, especially people that like I grew up watching. Um, there's a lot more of those going to the Hall of Fame. I'm getting older for some reason. But there was one I didn't really know who he was. Uh, he was number 53 for San Francisco. I, it doesn't matter. He gave a gospel presentation for his speech. He talked about Romans 3.23, Romans 6.23. He literally took him down the whole Roman road. And I was like, hey, wait a minute. I'm, I'm about to use that tomorrow in my, in my sermon. But I thought, man, what a, what a way. They can't, like, shut him off. I, they might try after, to, yeah, after last night. I mean, he, beautiful beautiful sharing of the gospel of Jesus Christ and he was thanking his his uh he was thanking a, a teammate who had um who had invited him to an FCA um event and he gave his life to Christ and it transformed everything about his life since then so he had a few minutes on the stage at the Hall of Fame um, in Canton, Ohio, which I got a story about that. Can I tell this real quick? Okay, I'm going to tell you. So um, years ago, when the Wyatts were moving to Boston, so Pastor Eric, Melissa, and the kids, the very little kids, they're not so little anymore, they were moving to Boston. And uh, I was one of the ones that drove a Penske truck all the way to Boston. And we were, trying to, we were trying to run away from a tropical storm on the East Coast. So we hadn't decided if we were going to go all the way east and then go north, if we are going to go through, like, which way we're going to go. We wanted to see the scenic route. We're going to be stuck three deep in a Penske truck. We're like, we might as well make this fun. So we, uh, we, we just kept monitoring the weather, and we got to Jackson, Tennessee, spent the night. We got to Nashville, and we're like, okay, do we want to keep going east, hit North Carolina, where I used to live, and go up the coast? I would love to do that, but, man, that tropical storm is, is over there. Why don't we just go north of Nashville, go through Bowling Green, uh, go up through Louisville, hit you know Ohio, all that stuff. And so we, we did that. We saw some really cool stuff, and we stopped at this little town called Canton, Ohio. And it was a hotel, and there was a Cracker Barrel next to it. You know, we had to decide based on the food options and um, we get we get to Cracker Barrel and and like there's like it's a ghost town and people are like hey you need to be out of here by like 9 30 and we're like well, what's going on at Cracker Barrel in Canton Ohio wherever this little town is and they said well we've got two people that are in town um, a lady named Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump are both here they're stumping for their presidential runs and they're both going to be here mid-morning so they're going to shut down all the roads and we're like oh that's weird Okay, we better get out of here. And so we leave about 10, 15 miles past Canton. I'm like, Canton, Ohio is the Hall of Fame of the NFL. Why didn't we go? I was so mad. I was so angry. I'm like, I wish I had paid attention about where Canton, Ohio was. And anyway, that's a really dumb story that was not in my notes. It was free. <laughs> but every time I hear Canton, I'm like, I've been to Canton, Ohio, where the Hall of Fame is. Never went to the Hall of Fame. Went to Cracker Barrel before Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton got there. So there you go. Where was I at? Verse 14. <laughs> Confession leads us to worship. Jenna said this beautifully earlier. It's God's kindness that leads us to repentance. And this confession causes us to worship and causes us to put our attention where it needs to be. Verse 15. Oh, Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. David wanted to be used by God. And he has been. Like you think about all the hymns and the songs, psalms and the spiritual songs that David penned, including this one. He says to the Lord right there in verse 15, Oh Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. He could have said, open my hand because I'm going to pen a bunch of songs that for thousands of years beyond my life, they will sing in a hymnal. They will sing in modern songs. They're going to sing in every... It's like, think of all the songs that have come directly from David's mouth, his heart, and his pen. Think about all... I mean, he, he didn't write all the psalms, but he wrote a lot of them. 
He, he may have written some that we don't even know. There's some that we just, we don't have a, we don't, we don't, we don't put an authorship next to, to a couple of them. We don't, we don't know who they came from. But they could have come from David. But I think when he, he says, Lord, I, I've asked you to deal with my sin. I've asked you to deal with me internally and, and, and transform me spiritually. And he says here, he says, Lord, use, my, use me. Open my lips and use me. My mouth will declare your praise. So I got a, I got a, I got a, I got a little comment for you. I've been, pretty, I've been pretty difficult on writers of songs if, like, public sin comes out. I'm like, oh, I'm not going to sing that song. That person, they, they were fake the whole time they wrote that. But then I had this thought this week, and I wrote it down. Think of all the psalms we read and all the songs we sing that were penned from this adulterous, murderous. Now, the second and third part is important. Repentant and confessed broken man. Shame on me to think that your sin is worse than my sin. My sin is not nearly as important as your, your sin. David was an adulterous, murderous man. After God's own heart, which he says, Lord, open up my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. Verse 16, for you will not delight in sacrifice or I would give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. Again, alluding to the ritualistic ceremonies that took place they were, that they were accustomed to. He knew the Lord would not be pleased with just lip service. It wasn't some special phrase, Lord, forgive us of all my, my sins and trespasses. It, it, it doesn't work that way. There's, a, there's an internal aspect that's got to be dealt with. The Lord wanted repentance. He wanted humility. He wanted sacrifice. And he elaborates on it in verses 17 through 19. So I'm going to read those together. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. Oh, God, you will not despise. Do good to Zion in your good pleasure. Build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then will you delight in the right sacrifices. In burnt offerings and the whole burnt offerings, then bulls will be offered on your, on your altar. David turns his private prayer into a corporate request where he says for all the people he wanted to look out for them. Our sin is not just a private matter. It affects the whole community. Just real quickly, I started thinking in Scripture. People that their, their personal sin affected the whole. Let's start in Genesis. Adam and Eve, their sin has affected us even to this day and will for eternity. I think of Jonah. Jonah's sin. He was found out. Like somebody on this boat is causing this, like this, this turmoil I don't know what this is, and you know they cast lots and all that kind of stuff, and he still, it was like, it was this guy. He, it's his sin. I think of Joshua 7, Achan. They've just been, they've been cleaning house in battle, and, 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 and Joshua is leading the people through some incredible militaristic uh, battle, and it's like, dude, they're, they're, they're not going to get beat by anybody. And Achan's sin, when they went through the camp, they realized it was Achan's little seemingly insignificant sin and it affected the whole David wanted to see his entire community he wanted all the Israelites he wanted the entire world to learn from his mistakes we see forgiveness turn to rejoicing and turn to teaching of God's mercies I'm almost done I'm going to read this quote to you G. Campbell Morgan who was uh, an evangelist um, um, in uh, the eight, late 1800s he says this I, I love this the great song talking about Psalm 51 Pulsating with the agony of a sin-stricken soul helps us to understand the stupendous wonder of the everlasting mercy of our God. Pulsating with the agony of a sin-stricken soul helps us to understand the stupendous wonder of the everlasting mercy of our God. I grew up hearing a phrase that every pastor I ever heard preach probably used it at some point. I think of Adrian Rogers who said this. I think of uh, Dr. Wayne Barber who said this. I think of my own father who said this. And it's a little phrase about sin. Sin will take you farther than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay, and cost you more than you want to pay. You everybody ever heard that one before? It's a, it's a great one. It's true. Sin will take you farther than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay, and cost you more than you want to pay. But in light of Psalm 51 this week, I decided, while I don't stand up there with some of these men that have preached these, this phrase, I, gotta, I want to add something I think in light of 51, Psalm 51 is true. Sin will take you farther than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay, cost you more than you want to pay. And if dealt with properly, you can praise louder than you have ever praised. Amen? 
when God does a work in your life, when he does a work in my life, it doesn't leave us like he found us. When spiritual transformation takes place, behavior modification comes, but when there's public profession, it's because this private confession takes place, and it's important, but it precedes the public profession of, listen, let me tell you, I've jacked up, I'm messed up, I'm broken, and I want to help you not go with the same things that I did. So let me tell you about a holy God who doesn't need to be sinned against. Let me tell you about a holy God who is not going to be mocked. He is not going to be made fun of. He is not going to allow us to continue to be defiant of him and then act like nothing ever happened with a little phrase of, oh, will you forgive me? No, he looks at our heart. Jenna, if you don't mind going and coming up here, we're going we're gonna to finish this out. But I just want to remind us of the purpose of our, our time today. When we deal with our sin, that's a big win. When we deal with our sin in the right way, there is an internal cleansing, there is spiritual formation, and there is eventual public profession that comes out. I'm not going to ask you to do what the Bible tells us to do, confess your sins one to another. We're not going to ask you to stand up right now and confess because I've already gone over. Ginger, sorry, I didn't make it 30 minutes. But I'm going to tell you this. There is something good for the soul to be honest and open with people that can bring accountability into your life. We need to know that, God, you only and you only have I sinned against. Yes. But that sinfulness affects others. And when we allow the Lord to transform us, we must take the position that David did. Lord, open up my lips and may it declare your praise. Here's what we do oftentimes. Lord, you know I'm sinful. And man, I could never get up and speak in front of somebody. And Lord, I could never go witness to somebody and tell somebody about Jesus because, man, they know how I am. Lord, Lord, they know the sinfulness. They know the words I've used. They know the tone in which I've used it. Lord, I, I could never be used of you. So I'm just going to shut myself up over here and alienate myself because I'm sinful and I can't be used of you. God used. Remember, what's the title? Man after God's own heart. When he very well could have used David, the adulterer and murderer. How we deal with our sin. Not if we sin. You're going to sin. You are sinful. You are a sinner. And on your best day, you cannot stand in the presence of holy God. Apart from his grace and his mercy. But my question today is, what are you going to do with it? going to do with your sin that defies holy God the next moment or so I'm just going to ask you to deal however you want to with it my hope and my desire is to see every one of us come to the place of Lord I can't you never said I could but you can't always said you would use me in such a way that honors you most use me down forward. If anybody wants to talk or pray, this altar's open. You can see uh, me or Pastor Eric or anyone really. We'd love to talk to you about the amazing grace of Jesus Christ.